Hey everybody, this is Dr. O, and welcome to Unit 1, the Endocrine System. So in AMP 1, you learned about the nervous system, and you learned that it was the uh, quick control uh, system of the body. And we also have a slow control uh, mechanism in the body and that is the endocrine system. So the endocrine system and the nervous system actually work together to coordinate what's happening throughout the body and we actually do need both of them to help us manage. We, we need a quick response system to help us in emergency situations and then we need a slow control system to help us manage long term. If we had only the nervous system we would be swinging between highs and lows all the time and that wouldn't be any way to live. Now, how does the endocrine system accomplish its communication? Well, it does it through hormones, which are chemical messengers that get transported in the blood. Now, one of the ways that the endocrine system differs from the nervous system, in addition to uh, the difference being speed, is that the nervous system has a tendency to have short duration in its effects, whereas the endocrine system has longer lasting effects. Now, if we look at the word endocrine, or endo, actually we have endocrinology right here. Endo means inside, crin means to secrete, and ology always means to study. So if we put those three things together, we're studying things that are secreted inside the body, which for us and this particular unit is going to be hormones. So what does the endocrine system control? Well, I could have just as easily said everything, <laughs> but I listed them out here on the slide. So certainly reproduction, that's under the control of a series of hormones uh, that uh, start up in the brain and then end, out, end in the gonads. Growth and development, that happens all over the body. The maintenance of electrolytes, water, and nutrient balance, that's, a, that's also a coordinated uh, event that happens between several different body systems. Uh, regulation of cellular metabolism and energy balance. Again, there's several different um, organs and body systems that are involved in that. And um, the mobilization of body defenses. So all of these are going to be managed by the endocrine system, or at least have endocrine system influence over them. So as you can see, endocrine system affects everything. Now, I said that the endocrine system is going to be about things that are secreted on the inside. And when we talk about the glands that are doing that, these glands are going to be ductless. They lack any sort of a duct. Now, why is that important? Well, because typically we have ducts that are responsible for moving products that cells make outside the body. And uh, a good example of a gland that has a duct is your sweat gland. So when we make sweat, we don't need to sweat on the inside. We need our sweat to we need our sweat to be on the outside. So the way that we get that sweat to the outside of the body is through a little tubule that we call a duct. Now that means that the sweat gland then is an example of an exocrine gland. Exo meaning outside. We're secreting on the outside of the body. So exocrine gland is an example of that. The sebaceous oil glands that you learned about being in the skin uh, in AMP1, those are also examples of that. Oh, and look here on the slide, we say saliva. What's up with that? Isn't that in the mouth? Well, believe it or not, the digestive tract is technically outside the body. Now you're like, oh, how can that possibly be? Because my stomach is in there. Well, the way that that is, is you need to think about it this way. Anywhere where there's blood, that's the inside of your body. If there's no blood, that's on the outside. I'm just letting that sink in for a second. So we do not have blood in our stomachs. We don't have blood in our mouths. We don't have blood in the esophagus. We don't have blood in the intestines or in the large intestines. Not if things are normal, you don't have blood there. Blood's moving around and floating around on the inside of the body. So that's why we would consider saliva to be an exocrine product. In fact, all of the digestive secretions are exocrine because they're going into um, the lumen of the digestive tract, which is the opening of the digestive tract, which is technically on the outside of the body. So I'll leave you with that. 
Now here I list a couple of, uh, of the endocrine glands. So pituitary, that's a big one, releases a lot of hormones that affect a lot of other glands in the body. Thyroid gland is also an endocrine gland. Parathyroid, which is located on the back of the thyroid. Adrenal glands, pineal glands. These are all examples of endocrine glands. This is not a comprehensive list. The hypothalamus, that's probably the big, big player here um, because a lot of things don't happen unless the hypothalamus gets involved. Hypothalamus is like the manager in the ivory tower keeping his finger on the pulse of everything that's happening and uh, releases hormones in response to different things that are happening in the body. The hypothalamus is part of the brain and uh, which means that it's going to be made of nervous tissue. So it's it's nervous tissue. It's an, it's nerve, basically. But it's nerve that can make hormones, which is why we call it neuroendocrine in nature. Now, some of our endocrine glands also have exocrine function. Pancreas is a great example of that. Pancreas not only makes things that get secreted into the blood, like insulin, but also, the pancreas makes the most potent digestive enzymes in the body, and that's going into the digestive tract, which you just learned is actually considered the outside of the body. Um, gonads also do this, as does the placenta, which is um, only a temporary endocrine organ because it's not around all the time. Only when the female is pregnant do we is there a placenta in place. And when it's there, it's going to be secreting hormones and it is considered to have endocrine function. Now, in addition to having organs that are technically considered part of the endocrine gland, there are other tissues and organs that uh, can release hormones. So for example, fat, fat can release a number of hormones. Um, the thymus, now sometimes the thymus is also considered part of the endocrine gland system, uh, but its effects are really directed towards the development of the immune system. So it's, it's a super focused um, gland as far as its function, uh, but it still has endocrine effect. So that's why it gets it's, it's why it gets talked about in the endocrine system. Um, the the walls of the small intestine as well as the stomach, they're actually releasing a large number of hormones. And in fact the intestinal tract is in communication with itself through both a nervous network called the enteric nervous system and through a series of hormones that get released. And the reason for that, if we think about it, is that the stomach has a really low pH, comes in at about the same level as battery acid, like around one and a half to two pH, which is super, super deadly to the rest of the body tissues. Rest of the body tissues can't really handle that. And where is the stomach delivering its products? Right into the small intestines, which tend to like to operate at a pH of about seven, which is neutral. So when the stomach and, uh, and the small intestines are connected physically, then that means that they also need to be connected with their communication so that the small intestines can let the the stomach know when it's ready to receive a little bit more of that highly acidic um, content that the stomach's been working on. So that's one of the reasons why we, we see uh, endocrine function in the small intestines and the stomach. The kidneys and the heart, um, surprising, surprisingly maybe to you that they are also in communication actually largely with each other and it all has to do with managing blood volume and uh, consequently blood pressure. So there's other organs that are releasing hormones specific to different types of tasks but we don't necessarily include them as part of the endocrine system although we do give a nod to them and some of the things that they're doing for us in this unit. So this is a great image that tells you what are considered the endocrine organs. And we see up in the brain that there are three of them. We have the pineal gland, the hypothalamus, and then coming off the hypothalamus is the pituitary. In the throat, we have the thyroid and the parathyroid glands. The parathyroids are little patches of tissue on the backside of the thyroid gland that are histologically distinctly different, which is why they're classified as completely different glands. But we call them parathyroid because para means next to or around. Then down in the chest behind the sternum, we have the thymus. That's the gland that's pretty much dedicated to immune function. Sitting on top of the kidneys, the renal glands, we have the adrenal glands. 
and uh, part of the intestinal tract, an accessory organ to the intestinal tract is our buddy the pancreas. But uh, the pancreas is also releasing hormones that go directly into the bloodstream, so it gets considered an endocrine organ as well. And then we have the gonads. In the female, the gonads are the ovaries, and in the male, the gonads are the testes. Now, as we said earlier, the chemical messengers of the endocrine system are going to be hormones. And we typically think of a hormone as having a long distance chemical arrangement with the body. So that uh, something that gets released up in the brain, such as from the pituitary, is going to be making its way uh, a distance away from the pituitary, like maybe going down to the throat or all the way down to the gonad. So distance is what really uh, we tend to think of as hormonal function. Now, why am I making that a big deal? Because of what's, I'm making a big deal because of what's also on this slide. I'm including an, a couple of other terms that you may see in your reading. Um, and that is an autocrine and a paracrine. Now, we have the, the word root crin in both of these words, but we have a, a different prefix. Uh, auto means self. As in, when someone writes their autobiography, they're writing about themselves. Well, if we have an autocrine, what's happening there is that you have a cell that's making a hormone that makes the cell itself do something. Now, you might think that sounds silly, but cells don't necessarily have a brain <laughs> to function with. But they do have ability to respond to what's in their environment. And sometimes the way that they, they get themselves to do what they need to do is you have the response mechanism. There's some sort of receptor on that cell that triggers uh, a response. And the control center is actually located inside the cell. And uh, the, as a response to that change in environment, the cell is capable of releasing a hormone that makes itself do something. So for example, the muscle uh, in the stomach, great example of this, because once there's something in the, in the, uh, the stomach, the, the muscles release a hormone that makes the muscle contract and aid in mechanical digestion. That's a, an example of that. Now, paracrines are um, cells that are going to make a hormone, not for themselves, that would be autocrine function, but for their neighbors, right next door, para, right next door. Um, great example of this is that within the, the pancreas, there are a number of different cell types, and there's like a regulatory type of cell there that uh, pays attention to the cells that are making insulin. And uh, uh, so, for example, when blood glucose levels rise, the uh, the beta cells are going to start making insulin, and um, uh, once there's a change in blood uh, sugar levels, they start to drop, then the delta cells will kick in and tell the, the beta cells to cut it out. We don't need any more insulin. So that's an example of um, a, a paracrine, the, is, is the delta cells getting involved, tearing, telling the, their neighbors, the, the beta cells, to to stop doing what they're doing. So that's a little bit about autocrines and paracrines. Now we don't consider autocrines and paracrines as part of the endocrine system technically, even though what they're making are hormones. And it has to do with um, the distance thing. Because it's not happening over there, it's happening all right here. So, but I wanted to include it so that you would have an understanding because I know you're going to be doing a patho paper here shortly and um, your topic might cover this and I want you to have that information. Now there are two basic types of hormones and we see one of them listed here on this slide. And these are gonna be amino acid based hormones. And sometimes I'll say amino acid based hormones and sometimes I'll just say protein based hormones because amino acids essentially make up proteins. So it's just kind of a language thing. But, but either case, um, we're talking about something that's being created from amino acids. And within this classification, we have three subdivisions. We have uh, hormones that can be made from a single amino acid that's been altered a little bit to make it biologically active as a hormone. So that's one type of a hormone. And these are pretty small molecules. So for example, let me give you an, uh, 
a tour of what we're looking at here. So wherever we have a pointy part on one of these structures, there's going to be a carbon there. And in an amino acid, there's going to be a carbon with a nitrogen off to one end, and then at the other end, there's going to be a carbon bound to a hydroxide, and then typically an oxygen. That's, that's going to be right here, typically. But in this case, instead of there being an oxygen, we've removed the oxygen and we've added this group right here. That's what we mean by derivative. We've taken an amino acid. This structure, this, this all out here, this is basically an amino acid. But it's uh, been altered by adding this functional group to it. So that's what I said. You take an amino acid, but then you attach something to it to make it biologically active. And that's what we've done here. But it's still basically just an amino acid molecule with this thing attached to it. So that's your amino acid derivative. Pretty small. Doesn't mean their effect is small, it just means that the molecule is small. Then we get into a slightly larger molecule, which is a, a peptide. And these are going to be short chains of amino acids. Still biologically active, still can have big effect, but uh, and bigger than an amino acid derivative, uh, but you know not as big as a protein. So for example, here we have oxytocin. Oxytocin has nine amino acids. Each one of these little circles represents an amino acid molecule. So basically, each one of these circles looks like this part of this molecule with, um, there's going to be another attachment roughly right down here. It's a chemistry thing. I don't want to get too chemistry e here, but that's basically what we're talking about. So each one of these is going to be an individual molecule. They're attached to each other. Each one of these is going to be an individual amino acid molecule attached to each other, creating this chain. In this case, it's creating oxytocin. So we can see we've taken, um, you know, a number of amino acids and put them together. Well, how many amino acids are we talking here? Well, it could be three amino acids could make up a peptide um, hormone. It could be upwards of 50 because it's not until we get around 80 to 100 amino acids in a chain do we actually start getting into the world of proteins. Yeah, that's just how it goes. That's, that's the way chemistry works. So, um, if we're looking at peptides, we're looking at small chains. We're not looking at anything greater than maybe about 50 to 80 amino acids. Uh, and here I'm just giving you an example of one that has nine in it. Now, proteins are super duper long, greater than 100. Many of the proteins in our bodies come in at about 1,000 to 1,600 amino acids in in the in their chains. Some can be as many as over 2,000. Not We don't have a lot of those, but we're talking a lot of amino acids. So they get really hard to, to draw, and they end up looking a little bit like this. This is an example of growth hormone. So here we see uh, norepinephrine, uh, oxytocin, and growth hormone on this slide. Very different hormones, very different effects, very different sizes, but no single one is stronger than the other particularly. Their effects are profound, regardless of what they are. So what's your takeaway from this slide? Well, the question might be, um, how many amino acids might it take to make up an amino acid derivative hormone? And you would hopefully say one. <laughs> how many amino acids might it take to make up a peptide? And you need to look at what options you're given. And if they said one, that would not be right. If they said 10, that would be a good answer. If they said more than 100, that would not be an answer. So your best answer would be 10. So that's the takeaway, to have some idea of the number of amino acids it takes to make up a peptide, um, a protein, and that single amino acid derivative-based hormone. Now, the other classification of hormone is the steroid hormone, and it's called a steroid because it's based on a molecule type called a steroid. Now, in our bodies, we take cholesterol, which is, a, a, is classified as a steroid molecule, and we make hormones with it. Now, how do you know you're dealing with uh, a, a cholesterol-based hormone? How do you know that you're dealing with a steroid-based hormone? Well, it's because it has these four carbon rings arranged like this. That's how we know that we're dealing with a steroid. 
So again, what we're looking at is everywhere we have a little pointy part in these circles, there's going to be a carbon with a couple of hydrogens attached, unless there's something else there. Like in this instance, instead of one of those hydrogens, they have a hydroxide group attached there. Um, and then at this end, we can attach a number of things, like here's a big chain of hydrogens and oxygens attached. Um, here we've attached a couple of things. Uh, here we've just attached a hydroxide, and the same thing is here. So again, what Mother Nature likes to do is she likes to take a foundational component, this four, uh, four rings right here, these four carbon rings, and then attach things to them. And the body seems to respond beautifully to doing that. So from cholesterol, we actually do use cholesterol. You might remember that from AMP1. Cholesterol is important in cell membranes because it gives it some integrity, helps shore it up, makes it a little bit firmer. That's good. But we also take cholesterol and we make things with it like estrogen and testosterone. Those are uh, gonadotropin type hormones, sex hormones. And we also make uh, aldosterone with it, with it, which helps us manage our water balance in the body. So very different hormones doing very different things, but they all come from a uh, steroid molecule called cholesterol. And because cholesterol is considered a, a, a lipid, um, you'll hear me say lipid-based uh, hormones or fat-based hormones in my language. And um, protein-based hormones and lipid-based hormones are going to behave very differently in the body because the body is mostly water. So we need to have an understanding of that. We're, we'll get into that here shortly. Now, hormones are going to circulate throughout the bloodstream. But their ability to act is going to depend on one thing, and that is if a cell has a receptor specific to that hormone. So only cells that have receptors for that hormone can be affected by that hormone. And we would call those cells that have those receptors a target cell. And once that hormone sits on a receptor, it's going to alter the activity that that cell is going to do. So let's say that we had a couple of hormones here. We have the round bottom green hormone, and we have the pointy bottom purple hormone, and it comes upon a cell with a receptor that looks like this. Well, obviously, this receptor is not a good fit for our green round bottom hormone, so that's not going to work. But our pointy bottom purple hormone, it's going to fit there just fine. And when it does, it's going to cause something to happen inside that cell. It's going to cause that cell to do something. We'll look at that in a little bit. Uh, but for now, let's just keep our, our eye on target cells. So for our, our green round bottom hormone, it's going to have to continue on until it finds a cell with a receptor that looks about like that at which point it can come and sit in that receptor and make some magic happen for that cell. So this is the idea behind a target cell. It has to have a receptor specific to a hormone. Now a moment ago I said that we had um, we had protein-based hormones and we had fat-based hormones. And that it's going to become important to understand these because our body environment our blood plasma is mostly water. So how are these two hormones going to behave in blood, and how are they going to behave once they get to the cell? Well, um, our protein-based hormones are going to be largely considered water-soluble, which means that they're, that they're going to play nicely in water. So when we make those, we can just dump them right into the blood, and then they just travel along in the bloodstream until they get to where they need to go, and then they, they, they drop out of the blood and sit into a receptor. Um, this is going to be true for all but one of the protein-based hormones, and that's going to be thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone is put together just a little bit differently, and it's going to act like a lipid-based hormone, even though largely it is a protein-based hormone. So that is the one exception, and you're going to hear me say that several more times, um, just to help you remember it. So for all of our other uh, amino acid-based hormones, um, they're going to be able to get dumped right into the blood plasma, travel along just fine. Um, and when they get to the cell, they're going to be looking for a receptor that's on the cell membrane. And the reason for that is, is because they can't pass through that plasma membrane because it's made of fat. Because remember, it has those, those fatty acid layers in there. So it's going to be looking for its receptor on the cell surface. Now, once it lodges on that cell surface, its effects 
aren't, aren't going to be immediate. It has to go through what's called a second messenger in order to convey its instructions. So that's going to be something that we're going to look at in a little bit of detail in just a little bit. So um, for now, what we're going to say is water-soluble uh, hormones travel well in the bloodstream. Once they get to the receptor, it's going to be on the outside of the cell, and they'll sit in there, and then we're going to be activating a second messenger system, and we're going to go with that for now. Now, our lipid-based hormones are going to have to do something different, because if we drop those right into the bloodstream, it's not going to go so well. So um, our, our lipid base plus our thyroid hormone have to have an escort in order to travel through the bloodstream. So they have some sort of a taxi or an escort that helps them until they get to the cell where they need to do their action. And once they get to the cell, they're not going to look for a receptor on the outside because they are fat. They're lipid based. They get to slip right through that plasma membrane, which remember is fat on the inside. They just like say, look, I'm fat just like you. And they just slip right on in. And they're going to look for their receptor inside the cell. And once they get inside the cell and they, they hook up with their receptor, their receptor acts like their escort. And it, and it helps that, that hormone go directly into the nucleus where it, it does its gene transcription. So it does what we call direct gene activation, which is not something that our protein-based hormones do. We have to wait for that second messenger to get activated in order for the effects of the, the protein-based hormones to, to uh, kick in. Now, like I said on the last slide, our amino acid-based hormones aren't going to be able to directly influence the cell. Instead, what they're relying upon are, this, uh, are these second messengers. And there's a couple of second messengers that we're going to talk about. There's actually more than, than the two listed here, but the two big ones are cyclic A and P and the PIP calcium uh, second messenger. So let's have a look at those. Now the cyclic A and P is the one we're going to lean into the most, um, and we're going to go through this in a fair amount of detail. And giving you the detail about how this one works will make it much easier to understand how the other ones work, because it's just a slight deviation um, at one point. So when we're talking about a second messenger system, we're talking about trying to create not trying, we are creating that, that, that second messenger that's called cyclic AMP. Um, cyclic AMP stands for cyclic uh, adenosine monophosphate, which is just a couple of phosphates different than our friend adenosine triphosphate, which is that um, high energy cell ATP. See, that's something else about Mother Nature. She likes to take these molecules and just like, you know, cleave off phosphates and slap them back on and then do other things with them. So, so this is basically taking an ATP molecule and instead of removing one phosphate to make ADP, we're taking off two phosphates to make AMP, that M standing for mono. We got one phosphate left. All right, so let's talk about what's happening here. So in the sequence of events, this is a little bit like a relay race where you have one, one runner handing off the baton to another runner who hands it off to another runner until we get to the finish line. So our first runner is going to be the hormone itself, whatever hormone is, uh, whatever protein hormone is we're talking about. And that's going to be our first messenger in this system. We have two messengers. The hormone is the first one. Uh, and the whole purpose is to get the creation of the second messenger, which is cyclic AMP. So our first hormone is going to bind to the receptor. The receptor is the second player. So, the, the, so now the receptor has received the baton and is going to hand it off to a G protein, which is this little protein that's one of the runners in this relay race, and it tends to hang out uh, at, this, at the inside of the plasma membrane waiting for a hormone to sit on a receptor. That's its job. That's what it does. It's like waiting for that moment. And so once we have the hormone sitting in the receptor, it recognizes that and it runs over there and it grabs that baton from this activated receptor. And now we've got an activated G protein. Well, what's the G protein going to do? It's going to continue to, the, to run along that race, got the baton in hand, and it's going to look for uh, adenylate cyclase. 
and it's going to run over to adenylate cyclase and hand off the baton to it. Now adenylate cyclase has been activated, and adenylate cyclase is going to be what takes ATP and cleave off those two phosphates and turn it into cyclic AMP, our second messenger. Now just because we have our second messenger, we're not done with our race because we have to wait for the second messenger to bring home the thing that we're actually wanting that hormone to create for us. So now the second messenger is going to go activate a protein kinase. And um, what do we mean here? Well, um, a kinase is a classification of um, molecules that can either make something happen or stop something from happening within the cell. So we might be thinking that it could be uh, creating a, uh, a product, like creating a protein or something. Or it could be that there's something that is in process and we want to stop that. And then the activation of that particular kinase would uh, be inhibitory in its effect. So at that point, once the cyclic AMP has been created, it's going to finish off the race by going and communicating with the kinase. And that's the point when we have achieved what we want by having that first messenger, our hormone, sit in the receptor. Now, what cyclic AMP is going to do, basically, is take one of these kinases and, and put a phosphate on it. And that will either cause that kinase to be um, an activated kinase, or it will cause it to um, be uh, an inhibitory kinase. And um, uh, so that's the effect that we're looking for. Whatever that, that hormone that we have sitting out there on the receptor surface, um, at the surface, that's what we're looking for. Now, the good news about cyclic AMP is that um, it, it, it can activate, but it can be quickly broken down. And that's going to become important when it comes to this second messenger system. So let me tell you a little bit about the second messenger system, and I'll say it a couple of times. I'll say it on this slide, and then I'll say it on another slide in case you feel like you need to, you're going to need to hear it again. So what happens with these second messenger systems is that you're going to have a huge amplification effect. So think about this. We have a hormone. It sits on a receptor. That one receptor can activate, let's say, 5G proteins. Those 5G proteins can go activate each five adenylate cyclases. So now we've gone from having 5G proteins to now having 25 adenylate cyclases activated. And now each one of those adenylate cyclases can activate another five cyclic AMPs. Now we've got 125 cyclic AMPs activated going out and activating um, kinases. And let's say each one of them does five. So you're already seeing that we're, we're well over 500 um, uh, protein kinases having been activated just because one hormone sat on one receptor. That's what we mean by having a huge amplification effect. Now, when I say it's kind of good that cyclic AMP gets very quickly degraded, that's because you don't want this amplification effect to keep going for too long because we've gotten such a bang for our buck by having one hormone sit on one receptor. So on this picture, I want to point out that one of the things this picture does for you is it lists all the players involved in the second messenger system. So we start off with our first messenger, the hormone, who's going to pass the baton off to the receptor, who's going to pass the baton off to the G protein, who's going to pass it off to the enzyme, and then ultimately to the second messenger. So let's put some words to this picture. So the first thing that we have happening is that our hormone, our first messenger, is going to lodge onto a receptor. Now that union is going to activate a G protein, and these G proteins live on this side of the cell membrane, on the inside. Now this activated G protein is going to go find uh, an enzyme, in this case adenylate cyclase, and it is going to activate the adenylate cyclase. Now the adenylate cyclase in turn is going to find an ATP, take off a couple of uh, phosph phosphorus, phosphates, there we go, and create cyclic AMP. 
At this point, we've created our second messenger. And what's our second messenger going to do? Well, it's going to activate a protein kinase. Now, in the act of doing that, it might inactivate a protein kinase, or it might actually cause a protein kinase to go do something. So these are the possibilities. Now, like I said on the previous slide, the beauty of this system is the amplification effect. So by having one hormone sit on a receptor, we can activate five of these G proteins. Now, each of those five G proteins can go out and activate five adenylate cyclases each. So now we've got 25 adenylate cyclases that have been activated. And each of these uh, adenylate cyclases could activate five cyclic AMPs each. So now we have, what, five times 25? 125? And then each one of those cyclic AMPs can maybe go activate another five protein kinases. And now we're well over 500 reactions happening. That's what we're seeking from our protein, our, um, our protein-based hormone right here. Now that's fabulous, but we don't want them hanging around too long, which is why this gets broken down rather quickly because there are, there are enzymes floating around in the cytoplasm right in, in here somewhere that will degrade these so that it doesn't keep going and going and going. But that's the beauty of the system. We get a big effect just from one hormone sitting on a receptor. Now, instead of creating cyclic AMP, we might be in the pro, uh, market for creating PIP. That's possible. And if that was the one we were looking for, then our G protein isn't going to activate adenylate cyclase. It's going to activate a different enzyme. This enzyme is called um, phospholipase C. So when a G protein is going to activate phospholipase C, what we end up creating is PIP2. Now PIP2 it's going to create two second messengers. It's going to create DAG, and then it's going to create IP. So instead of having cyclic AMP being created, we're going to create DAG and IP3. Now IP3 is going to cause the release of um, calcium from uh, storage sites. And then that's going to actually allow calcium to also act as a second messenger. So as I was saying from the previous slide, as part of this PIP uh, calcium signaling mechanism, not only do we create DAG, not only do we create IP3, but we also create calcium ions, and these calcium ions are another type of second messenger. So, so far the second messengers we've t discussed are cyclic AMP, um, DAG that was created from PIP, and IP3, which is created from PIP, and also calcium. So we're up to four right now. These are we've got four different second messengers that we've that we can create. And there's actually one more I'm going to throw at you. There's this one, cyclic GMP, which uses guanosine as opposed to adenine, uh, adenosine rather, adenosine. Um, it's just a different amino acid or amino acid type molecule. Um, uh, so it's just it's just another one. So we have a few different um, second messengers, five that we've we've looked at in total here. So the big ones that you probably need to know certainly cyclic AMP, uh, PIP, and uh, uh, DAG and IP3 that are created from that, and then calcium. I believe those are the the three big ones that you need to know from that. Okay, so now that we know all about protein and the second messenger system, let's talk about what our fat-based steroids are doing. Now, they're not looking for a receptor on the cell surface. They're going to go inside the cell. So they're looking for those intracellular receptors. So um, our, our fat-based hormones, as well as our friend, the thyroid hormone, these are going to diffuse through the plasma membrane, and they're going to look for an intracellular receptor in the cytoplasm. Now, once that hormone and that receptor have bound together, 
it creates this thing called the receptor hormone complex. Shouldn't come as a surprise. And that now has the capacity to enter into the nucleus. It'll do that through one of those little nuclear pores that are in the membranous cover of the nucleus. And it's going to go in there and it's going to figure out what part of the DNA it wants to read. So it's going to go in and it's going to bind to a specific region of the DNA because the, the uh, recipe for the protein that this particular hormone needs to make is going to be located in that section of DNA. Now what will happen next is that we're going to produce a messenger RNA. And all a messenger RNA really is, is just looking at that recipe for that protein and writing it down. It's like looking at your big cookbook and uh, go in there and looking for your brownie recipe and writing down the brownie recipe on a sheet of paper and then putting your cookbook away because maybe you don't want to have the big honking cookbook laying out on on your counter taking up all that extra space that's actually kind of a efficient way to do things um, so that's basically what messenger RNA is is that you you've copied a specific recipe out of the big cookbook and now you're going to take it to the kitchen and you're going to make it now, we don't necessarily take our messenger RNA to the kitchen. Um, instead, we take it to a ribosome <laughs> because a ribosome is going to be the one that makes our protein for us. All right, so here we have a picture because pictures worth a thousand words with these concepts. Let me get you oriented to what you're looking at. So here's our nucleus, big purple nucleus right here. We've got our double strand of DNA and um, out here is outside of the cell and here we have our incoming steroid hormone. And the steroid hormone is going to be able to trans, uh, uh, transfer itself right through the uh, plasma membrane because they're both uh, fat based. So um, it slips right past the membrane and then once it gets into the cytoplasm it's looking for its buddy the receptor right there so our little yellow fat based hormone is going to bind up with the orange receptor going to make this little candy corn looking thing right here the receptor hormone complex which is going to slip through one of these pores in the nuclear envelope um, and then it's going to look for the specific region in the DNA to bind to because that's where the recipe for the protein that that particular hormone wants made is going to be located. Now it's going to copy out that recipe by way of a messenger RNA. Doot, doot, doot. Let me get my words here. So there's the receptor uh, hormone complex going into the nucleus and then it's going to bind to that specific area of the nucleus because that's where the the recipe is and then it's going to basically cause the transcription of messenger RNA which is basically the copying of the recipe and then messenger RNA is going to slip out of the nucleus go find a ribosome and make that protein so that's what happens that's what this is what we call direct gene activation because basically our our hormone and its buddy the receptor creating this little candy corn looking receptor hormone complex are going to be able to go right into where the genetic material is and activate it. Now, how do we control the release of hormones? Well, there's a number of mechanisms that we can use to do that. Um, most of them work off of a negative feedback loop, although there's a few that, <laughs> that work off of a positive feedback loop. Um, but when we look at it, hormone release is, is either going to be triggered by some sort of an endocrine gland stimuli, which is, uh, could be um, coming through the hormone or something present by way of a hormone in the blood or something else in the blood um, or through nervous system input. So let's have a look at the details involved with this. So when we're talking about endocrine gland stimulation, it's either going to occur through something called humoral stimulus stimulation, neural stimulation, or hormonal stimulation. Um, and they're all very different, so let's have a look at each one of those. Now when we're talking about humoral um, stimulation or anything that has to do with the body's humors, what we're talking about basically is the blood. Um, sometimes we can be talking about other fluids as well, but typically we're talking about the blood. And in this case, what we're looking at is something in the blood triggering the release of a hormone. Now an example of that is um, the parathyroid monitoring blood calcium levels. 
So when blood calcium levels start to decline, the parathyroid hormone, who's always taking uh, samples of the blood and seeing what the calcium levels are, will note that and say, well, that's not good. I don't like that level. So I'm going to release my hormone, parathyroid hormone, and that's going to basically go down to the bones and uh, some other organs, but mostly the bones. We'll just say the bones for now and uh, stimulate the osteoclast to break down bone and release that calcium into the blood so that blood uh, calcium levels will come back up. So we could basically say that because of something changing in the blood, parathyroid hormone gets released. That is a classic example of humoral stimulation. Something in the blood caused the release of a hormone. Now, neural stimulation means that a nerve basically caused a gland to release its hormone. And the example that we give you at this point is the adrenal medulla. The adrenal medulla has nerves coming from the spinal cord to the inside of the adrenal gland. That's where the medulla is. And when it receives an impulse, it releases adrenal, uh, adrenaline and uh, noradrenaline. It causes the adrenal gland to secrete those catecholamines, which are adrenaline, noradrenaline, also called epinephrine and norepinephrine. So that is an example of neural stimulation. The stimulation came from a nerve. So in this image, we can see that we have the spinal cord, a uh, section of the spinal cord, and we have a nerve coming right out of here. And this is going to be part of the sympathetic nervous system. Because remember, we're releasing adrenaline and noradrenaline in response to a stressor. Uh, an emergency needs to happen. Um, and that's why we actually have the neural uh, stimulation, because we need for the response to happen quickly. We don't have time to wait around for those hormones to float around in the blood and then eventually get to the adrenal medulla. We want it to happen now because the bear is here now and we need to run now. Now the last uh, stimuli that we're going to talk about is hormonal stimuli. And this means that a hormone um, basically causes the release of another hormone. And this is a lot of what we see with the endocrine system, um, because as we're going to get into in a little bit, the anterior pituitary releases uh, six different hormones that go out into the body and cause other endocrine glands to release other hormones. That's hormonal stimulation. So um, let's look at what we have here on this slide. So, oh yeah, here we go. We're going to actually start with the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus communicates intimately with the anterior pituitary. And basically, the hypothalamus tells the anterior pituitary which hormones it wants it to release. So the hypothalamus is always releasing hormones that are basically going to stimulate the anterior pituitary to release more hormones. That is an example of hormonal stimuli. Now, if we look at what the anterior pituitary is doing, is it gets a, a hormonal signal. So as a result of that, it's going to release hormones. And its hormones might go down to, I don't know, the gonads. Classic example of hormonal stimulation. So it's when a gland releases a hormone, and that circulating hormone causes uh, the release of a, a um, causes a target gland to release another hormone. That is what we're talking about with hormonal stimuli. So what we're looking at on this slide is we have the hypothalamus and it's made a bunch of hormones. That's what the little black dots are. And they're going to go down and they're going to tell the uh, anterior pituitary, I want you to release a hormone that's going to go tell the thyroid to release some hormones. So it releases something called TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. And that goes down to the thyroid because the thyroid has a uh, receptor for that. And in response, the thyroid is going to release thyroid hormone. Um, part of the, the message coming from the hypothalamus might have been to cause the adrenal cortex to release hormones. So the anterior pituitary releases adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH, which makes its way to the adrenal cortex. And then in response, the adrenal cortex releases its hormones. 
And maybe what was also in these hormones coming from the hypothalamus was uh, a note to the an anterior pituitary to release follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So it does, and that goes down to the testes, and in response, the testes release testosterone. So coming from hypothalamus to anterior pituitary, that's hormonal stimulation. Anterior pituitary coming to any one of these guys, that's hormonal stimulation. So we have two methods of controlling things that are happening in, in, in the body. Do they compete? I mean, does one step aside? I mean, what's happening there? Well, um, typically they're, they're working together, but the nervous system can make adjustments to hormone levels when we need to. And the reason why is that we have, um, we have the need for fast response like in emergency, emergency situations, and that will give the sympathetic nervous system the opportunity to override something else that might be um, being controlled by the endocrine system. Uh, and it allows for the body to uh, sequester resources in order to do an emergency action, which is typically geared towards saving life. So for example, if we're under severe stress, the hypothalamus and the sympathetic nervous system can actually override the effects of insulin and allow blood glucose levels to increase, which is what we need to have happen. We need that glucose to suddenly be very available um, uh, so that uh, the cells can, can utilize it uh, and the body can do different things uh, as a result of that stressor. So that's an example of that. Now in this section, we're going to look at what the hypothalamus is releasing as far as hormones and what those hormones are going to go do. And then we're going to look at the anterior pituitary and the hormones it makes and what those hormones are going to do. And then we're going to go look at the posterior pituitary and the hormones that it stores, because it doesn't make any, and what those hormones are going to do. We're going to start off by talking about the hypothalamus. Now the hypothalamus, like I said, is located in the brain. It sits above the pituitary. The uh, pituitary gland, it kind of dangles from the brain by this little stalk called an infundibulum. And uh, it's going to receive the messages from the hypothalamus. So what is the hypothalamus doing? Well, it's releasing uh, a set of hormones that are going to, these hormones right here, are going to go to the anterior pituitary and cause the anterior pituitary to do something. So this is how the hypothalamus is going to communicate with the anterior pituitary specifically. So let's start off by talking about gonadotropin releasing hormone. Now the way I've put this on all of these slides is I've given you the abbreviation and then I spell it out for you, and I highlight in red the letters that are used in the abbreviation and why we use those letters. All right, so gonadotropin-releasing hormone, what is that going to do? Well, it's going to go down to the anterior pituitary, and it's going to cause the release of the gonadotropic hormones. And the gonadotropic hormones are FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone, and LH, luteinizing hormone. And this is all about reproductive function. So let's look at the pictures that go with this. So we have our hypothalamus going to release gonadotropic releasing hormone, which goes down to the anterior pituitary. And to anterior pituitary looks at that hormone and says, I gotcha, you want some gonadotropic hormones released. That means I'm going to release follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. That'll either go to the testicles or to the ovaries. If it happens to land upon the testes, it'll cause the testes to release testosterone. If it happens to land on an ovary, it'll cause the ovary to release estrogen. This is the whole picture of what's happening here. And that's how we're going to go over each one of these. So let's keep going. So here we have corticotropic releasing hormone. Um, the important word here is cortico. Uh, that would be cortex, looking at the adrenal cortex specifically. So what we're doing here is we are wanting the release of ACTH from the anterior pituitary. We're looking for adrenocorticotropic hormone. So the hypothalamus is going to release 
corticotropin releasing hormone that's going to go down to the anterior pituitary. Anterior pituitary says, oh, I see what you want. You want me to release some ACTH. And then that's going to go into the bloodstream. And then it will find the adrenal cortex and land on the receptors there. And it'll cause the adrenal cortex to release three different hormones. And the classifications are this. Mineralocorticoids, glucocorticoids, and androgens. Now, I know you don't know what those are just yet, but we're going to go over that shortly. For now, what I want you to understand is that when the hypothalamus releases corticotropin-releasing hormone, it's going to cause the anterior pituitary to release ACTH, and the target is the adrenal cortex. The hypothalamus could also release thyrotropin releasing hormone and the root word thyro has to do with thyroid. So indeed this is going to go down to the anterior pituitary and tell it to release thyroid stimulating hormone which will target the thyroid gland. So let's look at that flow chart. Hypothalamus releases thyroid, excuse me, thyrotropin releasing hormone which goes to the anterior pituitary. Anterior pituitary says, ah, I know what you want. You want me to release some thyroid stimulating hormone. And that goes to the thyroid. And in response to TSH, the thyroid releases T3, T4 hormones, which were just, which often just uh, generically called thyroxine. We'll talk about T3 and T4 in a, a little bit later, specifically what that is. But for now, we can just think of it as thyroid hormone. Now, at this point, there are two hormones that have um, a releasing hormone and an inhibiting hormone associated with them. And here on this slide, we're looking at prolactin. So hypothalamus releases prolactin inhibiting hormone, and it also releases prolactin releasing hormone. And let's talk about the hose. Let's first off talk about prolactin releasing hormone. So let's say that the scenario is such that the body needs to make milk. Well, then the hypothalamus would release prolactin releasing hormone, and that would go down to the anterior pituitary. Anterior pituitary says, aha, I know what you want me to do. You want me to release prolactin, and prolactin will go to the mammary glands, which will cause the mammary glands to produce milk. Now, not everybody needs to be producing milk. There's only uh, a short window of time when the body needs to be doing that, such as when there's a baby on board. But what if there's no baby on board? Well, then the body will be making prolactin inhibiting hormone. So how does that work? Well, basically the hypothalamus is taking uh, blood samples because it has a little chemistry lab set up and it's constantly taking blood samples and it takes a blood sample and says, do we need to make any prolactin? Not today. And then it releases prolactin inhibiting hormone so that we don't have the release of prolactin. That's how that works. Do we need it today? Nope. Still no prolactin need. Going to just release some more inhibitor so that anterior pituitary does not release any prolactin and we don't have uh, the production of milk. So most of the time the body is under the control of prolactin inhibiting hormone. Most of the time it is. Now, growth hormone is the other one that has a releasing hormone and an inhibiting hormone. So let's look, let's look at what's happening with uh, the releasing hormone. Here's our hypothalamus. <clears throat> it releases growth hormone releasing hormone, and it causes the anterior pituitary to release growth hormone. Now, something funny happens here. Because growth hormone doesn't directly go out and cause growth, what it does is it goes to the liver and other tissues, and it causes them to release insulin-like growth factors. And it's these insulin-like growth factors that actually lead to growth in our tissues. So growth hormone doesn't directly do it. It stimulates the next thing, which is insulin-like growth factors. Now, once we have enough circulating levels of uh, growth hormone and insulin-like growth factors, those end up acting as negative feedback mechanisms, and it'll cause the hypothalamus to release growth hormone inhibiting hormone so that it will stop the release of growth hormone 
from the anterior pituitary. So it works by negative feedback. This one does. Okay, so now we know that the anterior pituitary is going to be told what to do, basically, by the hypothalamus and all the hormones that are involved in that. Now, if we look, and we've also looked at what the anterior pituitary is going to do as a result of that. So we've looked at follicle-stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone, thyroid-stimulating hormone, prolactin, and growth hormone. We're just going to go over them again. Now, the thing that is new on this slide is that of the six hormones, four are going to be the triggers for the release of other hormones. Two of them are not. Four of them are. The two that are not responsible for the release of other hormones are going to be prolactin, because prolactin causes the secretion of milk, the production of milk, I should say, not the secretion, but the production of milk, and growth hormone. Because remember, growth hormone is going to trigger the release of insulin-like growth factors, which are technically not hormones. But everything else is going to cause the release of a hormone. So let's have a look at that. So let's start off by talking about the gonadotropins, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Now, follicle-stimulating hormone is all about the production of sperm and egg. Sperm and egg are called gametes. Um, and I use those terms interchangeably. So follicle stimulating, if we think about that, this is what triggers the uh, development of sperm and egg. Now luteinizing hormone is going to basically uh, create the scenario that's just right for sperm and egg to develop. And um, what it's going to do is it's going to trigger the release of hormones um, so that it helps direct the maturation of the egg and um, also trigger the uh, production of testosterone to trigger the release of, or trigger the production of sperm. Now in addition to triggering those releases, um, luteinizing hormone also helps set the stage in, uh, in both of those gonads so that the development of sperm and egg happen um, in the right course of events. So I like to say at this point that follicle stimulant, because we've got an entire unit dedicated to, to, to this. So for now, the way you can differentiate these is that follicle stimulating is all about sperm and egg, and luteinizing hormone is basically about ensuring that the stage is set so that the sperm and egg are successful. And that's really all you need to know at this, at this point. Now, before puberty, we don't actually see the production of follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. It's only after the onset of puberty that we see this. And um, puberty, kind of that magical moment when the hypothalamus starts to release gonadotropic-releasing hormone. Um, and uh, it, it takes a number of years for the communication between the hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary, and the gonads to kind of normalize and for things to function correctly. It takes about, about three years um, before, you, before the female starts having normal cycles, um, normal regular cycles, and it takes about that long for the male to um, have testosterone levels normalize and <laughs> and uh, level off and be where they should. So the thing between the, the relationship between follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone and estrogen and testosterone is that those two work in a negative feedback. Once circulating levels of estrogen and testosterone are where they need to be for whatever is happening, uh, then it tends to shut off the release of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. There's a, there's a lot more to it than this, but for now we're going to leave it at that. The anterior pituitary is also secreting adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH, and this target is the adrenal cortex. And once the adrenal cortex receives that ACTH, it's going to release three different uh, uh, corticosteroids. And there's a, a couple of triggers that can cause 
um, the release of ACTH. Uh, and one certainly is coming from the hypothalamus, uh, releasing corticotropin, um, releasing hormone. But why do we even release that? Well, there are normal fluctuations that occur in the body, normal physiological cycles that occur that can, uh, that will trigger the release of um, CRH from the hypothalamus and then consequently trigger the release of ACTH from the anterior pituitary. Other things can also trigger the release of this series of hormones. For example, fever can do it. Um, uh, uh, hypoglycemia, low blood blood sugar can do that. Also, if we're under stress, that'll also trigger the release of these hormones. So there's a, kind of a, a very a range, array of, um, of factors that can cause the release of the uh, corticosteroids. Thyroid stimulating hormone is released from the anterior pituitary as a, as a result of thyrotropin releasing hormone coming from hypothalamus. And thyroid stimulating hormone has a target of the thyroid and it'll trigger the thyroid to release thyroid hormone. We're going to refer to thyroid hormone as a couple of different things. Uh, we'll refer to it as thyroid hormone. We'll refer to it as thyroxin. We'll refer to it as T3 and T4. And we'll explain all of those because there is a, um, a learning outcome specific to the thyroid gland. But for now, we can just leave it as that. Now we've talked a little bit about prolactin and we know that prolactin comes from the anterior pituitary as a result of prolactin releasing hormone coming from the hypothalamus and that the target of prolactin is going to be the mammary glands and prolactin's job is to get the mammary glands to produce milk. Now normally we don't have a need to produce milk so most of the time the body is under the influence of prolactin inhibiting hormone. So we've got the hypothalamus taking a little blood sample, running some chemistry on it, and one of the questions it's asking is, do we need prolactin today? And if the answer is no, which it usually is, it releases prolactin inhibiting hormone. So that's almost always in play. Rarely is prolactin releasing hormone in play. Usually it is prolactin inhibiting hormone. So what triggers the release of prolactin? Well, increased estrogen levels will stimulate the release of prolactin. And we see this, these levels occurring towards the end of pregnancy, which, is, which happens to coincide with about the time the baby's going to show up. So the body, in its wisdom, understands and is reading all these hormones and understands at, uh, at the end of pregnancy that it's going to be time to start the milk production because soon there's going to be a baby. Another thing that can trigger the release of prolactin is the suckling of the baby. So the stimulation of, of, uh, of suckling, it's a neurological input to the hypothalamus. So this is an example of a neural, neural stimuli. So it provides neurological input to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus interprets that as a, as a, as a baby. And it says, you know what, We're, we need to uh, release prolactin, releasing hormone today because there seems to be a reason for uh, needing some milk. And so it releases that and in turn, it also encourages the anterior pituitary to release um, prolactin to continue the production of milk. Now this is also an example of a positive feedback, feedback loop where there's a baby and um, get the neural stimuli and that neural stimuli says we need some more so we produce more. That's a classic um, positive feedback happening there. Now we've talked a little bit about growth hormone too and we said that growth hormone has indirect effects and that it has to go to the liver and create these insulin growth, uh, uh, insulin like growth factors in order to get tissues to grow. But it also has a direct effect. Now, its direct effects are not on uh, getting tissues to grow, but it, it's, it has more to do with glucose management and fuel sources. So the direct actions that growth hormone has is specific to metabolism and it does something that's called glucose sparing. Basically what it's doing is it's overriding any insulin that might be floating around and it's causing glucose levels in the blood to elevate. 
It and one of the ways that it does that, like I said, is to dampen the effect of insulin. It also triggers the release of our stored glucose, which is stored in um, a chemical called glycogen. Basically, the body has a way of capturing glucose and knitting it together in these long chains, and that's what we call glycogen. And it'll cause the body to release those uh, those glucose molecules out of those those chains of glycogen and flood the blood with it. Um, it also causes the blood to um, fill with fatty acids. So it's, it's, it's harvesting fatty acids from various sources and, and putting that into the blood. Now, why would it do that? Well, there are some tissues that preferentially like to use fatty acids for a fuel source instead of glucose. For example, skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle preferentially uses fatty acids to do its breakdown and get ATP. Um, some tissues only can use glucose. The brain is an example of that. You can, you can send fatty acids up to the brain and it won't know what to do with it. It's waiting for a, a steady supply of glucose to make its fuel. So um, that's one reason why you'll see blood levels of fatty acid um, starting to elevate is because tissues can use fatty acids uh, in order to make, make fuel. Another thing that's going to happen is that growth hormone will encourage cellular protein synthesis. So it's going to encourage cells to make protein. So these are some of the direct effects of growth hormone, but you can see they're specific to metabolism and not to growth and development. That falls under indirect effects. Now, as we said, the indirect effect is going to cause the release of those insulin-like growth factors. And those are going to come from the liver, as well as skeletal muscle and bone. And we saw, we talked about earlier that the insulin-like growth factors are going to cause cells to take up nutrients in order to uh, get enough resources to duplicate DNA and do cell division. So that's one way that we, we grow. The other thing that it's going to do is going to stimulate um, the formation and deposition of collagen and minerals in bone or in order to harden our bone, which is also a good thing. Uh, growth hormone is going to stimulate most of the cells uh, to enlarge as well as to divide. But uh, the major targets of growth hormone are really going to be all about skeletal muscle and bone. So how do we regulate growth hormone? Well, remember that has a, an inhibiting hormone um, and a releasing hormone that comes from the, anterior, the hypothalamus going to the anterior pituitary. So when we, when we uh, are looking for the release of uh, the, the growth hormone releasing hormone, what's going to trigger that is low blood growth hormone levels as well as low blood glucose or possibly even high amino acid levels. So if we don't have enough growth hormone, if we have low blood sugar, or if we have high amino acid levels in our blood, then that can be enough to say to the, the hypothalamus, now's a good time to give the body some growth hormone. So off we go. Now, what happens uh, to, to stop the flow of growth hormone? Well, that, would, that, that happens when the hypothalamus releases the inhibiting hormone. Now, what's going to trigger that? Well, it's when we have uh, uh, pretty healthy levels of growth hormone and insulin-like growth factors floating around in the body. So as you can see, in both cases, what we have here are, are negative feedback loops taking place. So that when um, uh, we have high levels of growth hormone, it'll trigger inhibiting hormone to stop the release of any more. And when our growth hormones are low, it triggers the release of the releasing hormones to bump those back up. Now, I mentioned briefly that the pituitary is attached to the hypothalamus through a little stalk-like structure called uh, the infundibulum. Now, the infundibulum is not specific to the pituitary hypothalamus uh, part of the body. Infundibulum basically just means a little attachment area. There's a couple of 
different terms that are used for that sort of structure, um, but it's used here. So that's what we're going to use. Um, so when we think about the hypothalamus, it's, it's, it's attached to the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. Now, the, the pituitary is, is two glands in one, which is why we refer to anterior and posterior, and they're doing very different things, uh, very much like the adrenal gland is, um, except that that's a, a cortex and a medulla arrangement. So we talked a lot about the anterior pituitary up to this point, and we've said that the anterior pituitary secretes six different hormones. Well, it, because it's, it's capable of making these hormones, we call it a glandular tissue. It's a gland of sort because um, glandular cells make products and secrete them. So that pretty much describes the anterior pituitary. Um, the prefix right here, adeno or adeno, actually means glandular. So another name for anterior pituitary is the adenohypophysis. Now the posterior pituitary is mostly neural tissue and it does not make any hormones, um, but it stores hormones for the hypothalamus. And because it is post, uh, neural tissue, we would call it the neurohypophysis. So you may see both of these terms in your reading or maybe even in the textbook. And you'll have to remind yourself that adeno is glandular, anterior pituitary, neurohypophysis is the posterior pituitary. And how the hypothalamus communicates with uh, the anterior and the posterior pituitary is, is through different means. So let's take a look at that. Now the anterior pituitary is going to be connected with the hypothalamus through a special capillary blood vessel network that's called the hypophyseal portal system. So you might be asking yourself, what is a portal system? Well, a portal system is um, a blood vessel or a group of blood vessels that are doing something other than returning blood from an organ back to the heart. It's basically taking a detour. And in this example here, the blood vessels that are leaving the hypothalamus are not designed to take that blood directly to the heart. Instead, it's, it's taking a detour and it's taking that blood to the anterior pituitary. Now, the reason why we have that little vascular network between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary is because the hypothalamus makes hormones that are designed to go to the anterior pituitary. And it's efficient just to have a, a blood network that's going to carry them directly there, as opposed to dropping those hormones into the, the systemic circulation and having them travel throughout the body and then eventually get to the anterior pituitary. So that's why we have a portal system, is so that we can expedite the transmission, the transport of some sort of a, a, a product to another part of the body. Um, and that's what we see happening here. So this part of the slide details what you have. So originally you have a little capillary bed that is attached to the hypothalamus and then it gives way to a series, uh, a couple of veins, these are the portal veins, and then it um, becomes another little capillary bed that's going to be <clears throat> found at the anterior pituitary. So when the hypothalamus releases its hormones, it goes into that capillary bed at the hypothalamus, travels down those little veins, goes to the capillary bed at the anterior pituitary, and then those hormones find their way out of the bloodstream and to the cells of the anterior pituitary, and then we get the response that we want. So on this slide, I'll give you the picture. So here's the hypothalamus. And remember the hypothalamus is nerve tissue, so these nerves um, are special and they are making hormones that are going to travel down their axons to their terminal ends and it will release their hormones um, into this little capillary right here. And then that blood is going to follow, uh, take those uh, hormones down through this portal system where it will enter this capillary bed that surrounds the anterior pituitary. And then those hormones have an opportunity to slip out of the bloodstream and then engage with the cells of the anterior pituitary and trigger the next thing that needs to happen. And then those hormones will enter this blood system and then off it goes. Now, I don't have a picture for what's happening with the posterior pituitary, but what hap what's happening here is some of these nerves 
are going to come down and they're going to synapse with the nerves that make up the posterior pituitary and release the hormones that are also being made by the hypothalamus because the hypothalamus makes more hormones than just the ones going to the anterior pituitary. So let's talk about uh, posterior pituitary next. So like I said, posterior pituitary is kind of like an extension of, of the hypothalamus. It is kind of like a downgrowth of the brain. And uh, it maintains its communication with the hypothalamus through a um, neurological tract. And it's called the hypothalamic hypophyseal tract. And it also runs through the infundibulum along with those portal veins that we see running from the hypothalamus down to the anterior pituitary. Now, the hypothalamus is going to make two hormones. They're called oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone, ADH. And these get stored in the posterior pituitary. And when the posterior pituitary is to release those hormones, it gets a signal from the hypothalamus to do so. So that's how that happens. Now, like I said, the posterior pituitary is kind of like an extension of the hypothalamus and the, the, uh, the, the, the posterior pituitary is essentially the axon terminals of some special um, nerves that are coming, uh, that are continuations of the hypothalamus. And it's, it's in those terminal ends of the axons that we're going to see the storage of oxytocin and ADH. Now, oxytocin and ADH are both composed of nine amino acids. We actually looked at oxytocin before, um, and they're really close to each other, except they're off by two amino acids, which is interesting because oxytocin is about um, the, the milk letdown reflex. That's what allows milk to eject from the mammary glands. It's also called the cuddle hormone, which um, is a hormone that gets released uh, 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 after sex and during uh, uh, breastfeeding that helps create bonds between um, couples and between mother and child. Whereas ADH is basically regulating urine production. Very different hormones, off by two amino acids. And look, both of them are peptides, only nine amino acids long. Now, oxytocin is also responsible for stimulating uterine contractions during labor. And that's going to be a positive feedback loop. So as long as there is the stimulus we're going to get more oxytocin and more uterine contractions. And like I said on the previous slide, um, the oxytocin is also the trigger for milk ejection. It actually takes two hormones to get milk to the baby. Um, one of them is prolactin, which causes milk production, and then oxytocin actually allows the mammary glands to release it. So it takes both of those hormones for that to happen. And uh, milk ejection and uterine contractions both function under positive feedback loops. Now, interestingly enough, um, oxytocin doesn't use cyclic AMP. This is a hormone that actually uses the PIP calcium second messenger system that we talked about earlier. So um, oxytocin is, uh, we can conclude from this, is a protein-based hormone, but we actually said that because we said it was nine amino acids long, so we already knew that. Just kind of pointing all this out. Now, in the hypothalamus, along with our chemistry lab, we also have something called osmoreceptors, and what these are measuring are uh, the concentrations of solutes in our blood plasma. It's measuring how concentrated the particles are in the blood. Now, when they, and it's like it takes uh, like a cubic inch. It really doesn't, but let's say it took like a, a cubic inch of, um, of blood. That's a certain volume of blood, and it counts the particles in there. And um, basically, if, if there's a lot of particles in there, then it's assuming that the, that overall there's a, a decrease in the fluid part of the blood. But if there's fewer particles in there, then it's assuming that there is um, more fluid to the blood to kind of dilute those particles. So th that's one of the things that the hypothalamus is looking at. So if the osmoreceptors get triggered 
because the concentration is too high, there's too many particles given a certain volume of blood, then the posterior pituitary is going to be triggered to release antidiuretic hormone. Now, antidiuretic hormone is going to go down to the kidneys. There's these little structures there that are doing um, filtration, um, and they're called tubules. There's a whole tubule system in the kidney that does this. And it's going to cause the tubules to pull water out of the filtrate that's destined to become urine. So it's going to pull that water out of there and return it back to the bloodstream so that we can boost up the blood volume. So that's the whole purpose of antidiuretic hormone. Now, other reasons why antidiuretic hormone might be released in addition to high concentration levels is pain. The body kind of senses that if there's a lot of pain, if there's a lot of pain, we must be bleeding. And if we're bleeding, we're losing volume. So we got to hang on to volume. So we're going to release antidiuretic hormone. Um, which is uh, the next thing, low blood pressure. Low blood pressure is directly tied to low blood volume. So if we're bleeding out, we're going to release ADH in order to recover fluid that's destined to become urine because we need it in the uh, bloodstream in order to keep blood volume because we're spilling it out. There's also drugs that can um, alter uh, blood volume and blood pressure that can cause a trigger, uh, that can trigger the release of ADH as well. But we, but it's mostly under physiological um, <laughs> input that we would do that. Now, the uh, the release of antidiuretic hormone can be inhibited by drinking alcohol. So let's think about this. A diuretic makes you pee. This hormone, antidiuretic, makes you not pee. So if you're suppressing your do not pee hormone, guess what you're going to be doing? You're going to be drinking beer and peeing a whole lot. So yeah, that's what's going to happen when you drink alcohol. That's why that's why when you when you drink alcohol, it makes you it makes you urinate. It, it basically dehydrates you, and that's kind of the basis of a hangover is that you're really really dehydrated. So it's always good to stay hydrated if you're drinking beer or alcohol, or wine, whatever. Um, stay, stay hydrated because you're losing a lot of fluid because you're suppressing antidiuretic hormone. Um, if we have high concentrations of antidiuretic hormone, um, uh, one of the additional effects of that is to cause your blood vessels to constrict. Now keep in mind, this is because the, the body thinks that we're losing blood and so it's going to cause the blood vessels to kind of uh, reduce their size which will reduce the volume that they can hold and that'll help um, keep blood pressure up in the heart and in the vital organs so um, that that's kind of uh, the way all of that mechanism works we're going to take a deep dive into this when we get into um, blood pressure and the blood vessels and the whole cardiovascular system uh, one of the reasons um, and, and, and as a result of this reaction, this vasoconstriction, uh, antidiuretic is also called vasopressin, vaso meaning vasculature. And this is the end of part one. The rest is continued on part two.